Good grief. You're utterly incompetent. Sean, my husband, taunted as he splashed beer on me while I was laid up in bed with a high fever. Make sure everything's cleaned up by the time I return. And shake off that fever too. With that, he left me to attend his sister's wedding. Seizing this moment, I set in motion a plan I have been formulating for some time, leading to an unfortunate outcome for Sean. I'm Becky, a 30-year-old office worker. My husband Sean is 33 years old. We fell in love while working together and eventually tied the knot. Sean and I started off as co-workers. He was my superior and responsible for my training. This setup brought us close and sparked a relationship. After three years of dating, we got married. As my senior at work, he would foresee the challenges I might face, prepping tasks and organizing meticulous resources for me. He was a really reliable colleague. But he could also be overly possessive. Every time I was working late or felt overwhelmed and tried to seek help from other seniors or managers, he'd interject. Why didn't you come to me earlier? As your mentor, you should be reporting to me constantly. Showing some anger towards my approach. From my perspective, solving issues independently without his assistance would foster my growth. Most importantly, I didn't want to cause him any inconvenience. That was the intent behind my actions. So I retorted. If I keep leaning on you, I'll be helpless when you're busy or not around. Well, you'll learn over time. As a newbie, it's better to rely on me, your mentor. He countered, mostly disregarding my arguments. I thought that was just how things were supposed to be. Initially, I depended on him for every little thing as he suggested, but I started doubting this dynamic and decided to privately discuss it with my manager. My manager expressed, it seems like you have a closer bond with your mentor compared to other newcomers, and other employees are missing out on understanding you fully. That's what I thought. I'll strive to be more self-reliant. Sean might be overly eager, as this is his first time mentoring. I don't think he's deliberately stunting your growth, so don't let it upset you. Oh, absolutely not. On the contrary, I feel truly sorry for imposing on him unknowingly. Following this conversation, my manager offered to have a chat with Sean regarding my training. I'm not sure if my manager had a word with him, but Sean approached me soon after. Did you speak to the manager? He had a discussion with me about your training. Oh? What did he say? that you should interact a bit more with the rest of the team. Oh, I see. Did you mention something to the manager? Are you not happy with my mentoring methods? His tone seemed accusatory, but naively, I thought he was just being possessive. However, this moment would soon haunt me. With time, I gradually started networking with other colleagues, and my progress was recognized. Two years into the job, I was transferred to a different department and used this opportunity to step out of Sean's shadow. We started dating officially after he confessed his love for me. Being separated at work expanded my social circle, and our relationship struck a balance. We got married when I was 28 and moved into a property owned by my parents, but not in use. We hadn't lived together before getting married, and once we started sharing a home, Sean's true nature started to show. He was curious about every detail of my life, and whenever I questioned, why the need to know everything? Isn't it pointless to keep tabs on things that don't concern you? He would respond, 
You're not fully informed, so I want to help whenever possible. However, his behavior felt more like scrutinizing my every move rather than mere curiosity, and I soon felt uneasy under his constant monitoring. His behavior gradually intensified, and despite both of us working for the same company, he would say things like, Why is our home so messy? I know you're working, but can't you manage things a little better? Use your brain. Even when I retorted, But you could help out a bit too. He wouldn't give in, responding, I have a job with responsibilities. Just because we both work at the same company doesn't mean we have the same workload. If you were smarter, you could finish your work faster. There was no winning with him. Yes, he had been promoted, but I had my own juniors to mentor, and my work was busier than ever with other increasing responsibilities. I needed his help with household chores, but he seemed to hold the belief that housework is the wife's job, and he openly showed a disgusted face and attitude no matter how many times I asked for help. To avoid his attitude, I started to push myself to handle all the chores on my own. However, no matter how hard I worked to keep our home clean, he was never satisfied. Like a stereotypical nasty mother-in-law, he would run his finger along the edges of the room, saying, Did you even clean? There's a pile of dust. Or point out tiny wrinkles on his shirts. It seemed like he was determined to find fault. If you're going to be so critical, should we hire a maid? I've told you many times that I cannot keep up with the chores when we're both working. You don't want to help out. You don't want a cleaning service. You can't stand the slightest mess. Do you plan on making any compromises at all? I exploded with the truth that had been piling up day by day and spoke back strongly. Huh? You want to cover your own shortcomings with money? We're not both working so we can waste money like that. You call it wasting money, but if the chores are so behind that it's causing arguments, then hiring a maid is not wasteful, but rather a solution. Despite hearing my reply, he glared at me with an expression that seemed to say that this conversation was going nowhere, and said, Fine. I'll help out with the chores when I have time. Offering some sort of compromise. To me, frankly, I thought it would be reasonable for us to both share the chores equally since we were both employed, but for the moment, I accepted his offer. The following week, my manager pulled me aside, asking, Becky, do you feel overwhelmed with your workload? Huh? No, not really. I mean, isn't it about the same as what everyone else is handling? I answered truthfully to the manager's question, after which he started to fill me in. Sean, it seems, had been bragging in his department, saying, Becky is swamped and exhausted. I want to support her, so I do the housework on my days off to give her a chance to rest. His superior, having heard this, was concerned and decided to verify this with my manager. Sean's superiors, who were aware of this overprotective demeanor when he was my mentor, appeared somewhat taken aback. I felt quite embarrassed by this, and my manager agreed to clear the air with Sean's superiors, saying, Well, it's a family matter, so I don't really want to say anything, but if it's related to work, it's a different story. In the end, Sean seemed to have received a verbal warning not to overshare personal information with his colleagues. I was stunned by his blatant lie about assuming responsibility for household chores on his days off. So, you've decided to handle all the housework on your off days? I asked Sean when he came home. 
so you went behind my back and talked to the boss about our issues. You're mixing personal matters with work, even getting the boss to caution me. You've lost your senses. Against his argument, I explained that it was he who brought home issues to the company and that I learned of his words when the manager asked me about my workload. Look, you can't even do chores efficiently, and you can't utter a single positive word about your husband in public? I brushed off his sarcasm and wrapped up the conversation by saying, Let's cooperate in handling the household chores. I'll do as much as I can, and if there's anything you're not happy with, you do it. After this incident, his attitude got even worse. Despite his commitment to contribute to household chores, he barely did anything, like occasionally taking out the trash or washing his own dish, offering no substantial help. Even then, he was sloppy about sorting things out and would wash oily and non-oily dishes together, leaving me to rewash the dishes he'd cleaned. If I tried to point this out to him, he would snap back. I've been taking care of you at work for a long time, and you can't even help me out on things like this? You're really useless. Don't act superior at home just because you got a bit of work responsibility. I could feel my love for him and my happy memories slowly disappearing from my heart. One day, we received the happy news that his sister was getting married. Being a married couple, we were naturally invited to the wedding and we were set to attend together. The wedding of my sister-in-law was to be held at a location close to their family home and we planned to take a few days off and stay at their place. However, the clashes with them continued even as I was looking forward to my sister-in-law's wedding and I had decided in my heart that I would divorce him after the wedding was over. I was aware that he was deeply attached to me, so I had been discreetly gathering evidence to facilitate a smooth divorce. Above all, I was preparing to take a major revenge on him, who continued to belittle me as useless. Then, before we knew it, it was the day before my sister-in-law's wedding, a chilly Saturday. While I was out on the balcony hanging laundry, Sean inexplicably locked the balcony door from inside. What are you doing? You've been getting too sassy lately. Spend a day in reflection so you don't embarrass us in front of my relatives tomorrow. I was astounded at him laughing through the glass. As I had just stepped out to hang the laundry, I was lightly dressed for the temperature and didn't have my phone with me. I knocked on the door and pleaded, Unlock the door! I'll catch a cold! Many times, but he turned a blind eye to me and even went out. It was around the end of January, and I had to wait for him to come home, shivering in the cold. However, a few hours later, the lady next door noticed me crouching and shivering when she came out on her balcony to taking her laundry. She let me climb over to her balcony with a ladder, though it was a bit dangerous, and I waited for Sean to come home. The lady next door was very worried about me, and when I explained the situation, she even prepared a warm soup for me. After a while, I heard the sound of a car pulling into our driveway and realized that Sean was back. He was quite surprised to see that I had escaped the balcony, but he scowled at me with disgust, saying, I can't believe you dragged our next-door neighbor into our issues. We're a married couple and our problems should stay between us. Why do you always have to involve outsiders? I was so disoriented from the cold that I couldn't muster a response to his sarcastic remark, and I just crawled into my bed. The next day, as expected, I had a high fever and wasn't well enough to attend my sister-in-law's wedding. Seeing me like this, he clicked his tongue in annoyance and yelled without any hint of concern. If you can't even attend my sister's wedding, you're a complete failure as a wife. You're utterly useless. 
Moreover, he dumped a can of ice-cold beer over my head while I was sleeping, saying, Clean up this mess by the time I return, and shake off that cold too, before leaving the house. All I could do was reply quietly with a feeble yes to his retreating figure. Once I was certain that the sound of his car had receded, I got up from my bed and began executing my plans a bit earlier than I had anticipated. First, I contacted my attorney, who I had been in touch with, and requested him to dispatch a legal notice to Sean's parents' house, stating my intention to divorce him and seek alimony. I also reached out to my parents about my decision to divorce Sean and asked if I could move in with them for a while. Have you made arrangements to move? No, not yet. I made the decision last night, so I'm going to start looking for a moving company or a real estate agent from today. There's no need to wait. We'll come pick you up right now. I had previously hinted at my situation to them, and after overhearing the call, my brothers rushed to my house to help. Sean was supposed to stay with his parents for about five days, but if he saw the certified letter, there was a chance he would cut his trip short and return earlier. So we quickly packed my belongings and escaped from my home over the next two days, returning to my parents' house. The next day, I woke up to find a barrage of missed calls from Sean. Without giving them a second thought, I turned off my phone, caught up on some more sleep, and then got myself to the hospital. After getting some meds and getting my fever under control, I called up the real estate agent and said, I know it's sooner than we discussed, but I've decided to put the house on the market. The house we had been living in was an older property my parents had given me as a wedding gift, telling me, it's a pre-owned property, so once you have saved enough to build your own place, feel free to sell it and use the money towards your new home. When I decided to divorce Sean, I asked my parents if it was okay to sell the house, and they responded, Yeah, sell that house you lived in with that man right away. So I was able to sell it without any hesitation. Sean, totally oblivious to all these developments, bombarded me with calls and emails once I turned my phone back on. His messages were filled with arrogant remarks like, A divorce? Really? You who can't do a thing without my help talking about divorce and demanding alimony? Cool off and give it a thought till I return home. I simply replied, Anyway, I'm selling the house, so you might want to start looking for a new place. And then printed out these messages to hand over to my lawyer. The lawyer then instructed him to handle all further communication related to the divorce through him. Sean's daily belittling comments, his inappropriate behavior at work, and the incident where I was left locked out on the balcony on the eve of his sister's wedding, from where I had to be rescued by a neighbor, all played a pivotal role in getting the divorce finalized and securing the alimony. Until the end, he kept telling his lawyer, Becky can't live a normal life without me, and divorcing me would be nothing but a disadvantage for her. Please convince her somehow. So I had the lawyer tell him that I was capable of leading a much better life without him, and that his presence in my life was unnecessary. Later, I shared news of the divorce with my boss at work. However, Sean chose not to disclose it to anyone and instead made a surprise appearance to pick up Becky, followed me to my new home, and continuously sent me emails through the company's email system requesting reconciliation. His actions didn't go unnoticed by our colleagues and the HR department noted his misuse of company email. As a result, the company judged that he was stalking his ex-wife, me. Moreover, it seemed that he had been telling people he had bought the house we lived in under his name, but when my colleagues heard about me selling the house and moving, they saw through his lies. He was soon ostracized at work and labeled a liar. 
the company decided to transfer him to a regional branch. The manager told me this. We need you here in this department. There have been several complaints about Sean's arrogant behavior towards female colleagues, so this works out well. I have been considering quitting if his stalking continued, so I was truly grateful for the company's proactive stance. When I reported this to my lawyer, we decided to secure a restraining order against him. It was granted promptly, and I'm now living a peaceful life without his interference. It seems that from my early days at the company, he had intended to shape me into a woman who would comply with his wishes, always trying to meet my needs in a way that would make me reliant on him while discouraging dependence on others. After I left the department, he apparently tried to exert similar control over another new female employee. However, she proved to be assertive and he quickly gave up, redirecting his obsession towards me. When I learned from my lawyer about his manipulative mindset, it was shocking. However, on the flip side, I felt a wave of relief knowing I was free from such a person. Now, my life isn't dictated by anyone. I can wholly dedicate myself to my work, and being single allows me to take shortcuts with house chores. It's a comfortable and laid-back life. At this point, the thought of another romantic relationship isn't appealing, but if I do ever meet someone, I want it to be a respectful partnership without overstepping personal boundaries.